That's good. Off the splits. Perfect. I, I can actually see it on my side as well. I apologize. No problem. All right, good to go. So just a, a quick intro to me, and I know I've wasted three minutes on technology, so I'll do this one quick. Uh, background, I'm I'm in Florida, so I'm normally in flip-flops and, and t-shirts, and I get cold just thinking about Canada, even though I love the, love the country and love to visit. So um, I'm also a big kind of tech nerd, so my house power bill is probably on par with a super target or a large grocery store. Uh, lots of different equipment I like to test and, and work through. Just to just to reiterate kind of the goals of, of today's session, um, grasp what Zero Trust is and not, understand the industry view, and I think we'll have a lot of fun kind of making fun of some of the concepts of Zero Trust as well as talking about some of the technical realities of implementing Zero Trust. Um, happy to answer questions if you post them into uh, the the question window or chat window and, and kind of answer them as I go along. Uh, I will remind you, it's not a Cisco centric session. I'm not going to talk about any products today. So um, let's let's kind of jump right into you know where Zero Trust comes from and you know how the industry is kind of viewing and and really to do that you kind of go have to go back with a history lesson and and in history just like 2,000, 3,000 years ago to provide defense, we all started with, you know, castles and being able to establish a perimeter potentially with uh, concrete walls and moats to be able to provide that perimeter or trust boundary. And just like back in the day, the bad guys found different ways to, to penetrate to supersede those controls. And whether it be the Trojan horse, whether it be uh, scaling those defenses or advanced weapons and tactics, it was way too easy to kind of get around it. And that leaves us in a area in corporate IT where we, we experience the same thing. Uh, enterprises, organizations around the world started compute in a way where there was some form of corporate network perimeter, there was some form of establishment or trust based on that perimeter. And as bad guys, it's way too easy to, you know, do the the, the eight old ad, adage of, you know, research my target, do the reconnaissance, use phishing or another method to be able to infiltrate a single device. Um, in a lot of cases that essentially bypasses perimeter. And the real challenge here is lateral movement. So from one host, I can jump to many hosts. And from those hosts, really the goal is passwords, data, uh, and data center and, and trusted resources. Now, the, the interesting part about this eight old adage is I start to exfiltrate data and I immediately am able to inf uh, monetize information. Now, while this is hopefully a review for most of you within the audience. The challenge that exists today is, you know, while this seems rudimentary, it happens day in and day out. Uh, most organizations, even operating remotely, uh, have a lot of direct access to different resources inside of an existing perimeter, inside of existing data centers, co-location locations, as well as public cloud resources. Now, one of the, the fun things that I like to do uh, when working with different organizations is, is kind of prove this concept. And, and one tool that's out there that kind of helps prove that is uh, Infection Monkey. So those of you that have never seen it, it's been around for quite a bit. Uh, it's provided open source, so you can install it pretty much on anything Linux and be able to kind of successfully articulate and demonstrate lateral movement in lab environments and in production environments. And the goal with this is really to do exactly what I just showed you within uh, those uh, specific screenshots, but do it uh, systematically through this configuration. So essentially I give it some credentials, I give it the networks that I know about, I can have it run post, uh, post infection scripts. I can also have it do specific basic exploits across my environment. Now, once Monkey starts running, 
it actually helps you visualize that lateral movement. So it's going to, from that single infected host, start to jump around and try to find other direct communication paths. Now it can do this, you know, across networks. It can do it from private cloud to public cloud. It can use your brute force password list or other exploits to kind of jump around within within the environment. And the interesting part about this is most organizations, you can see, you know, multiple tiers of privileged or trusted communications across and it will keep going. So one of the post exploitation steps that Monkey does is actually installs its scanner software from that point of view into memory so that it's able to start that process out and, and continue to go. Now, you can make it run really fast. You can make it run slow. The moral of the story is exploiting and visualizing what we see from an existing perimeter trust and uh, a lack of real access control in organizations. Now, enter zero trust. Zero trust has been around as a concept for quite a while. And as I talked about kind of history, one of the big goals of Zero Trust started back in 2004. So in 2004, there was an international group of corporate CISOs, uh, Cisco and a bunch of manufacturers along with financial and public sector uh, individuals were all a part of this thing called the Jericho Forum. And they sat around and they focused on solving this, what they called at the time, the deparameterization problem. Uh, the really early output and actions out of the Jericho Forum was this need for trust. And essentially, at the time, you know, most organizations were starting to have more remote uh, workers, nothing like what exists today. So while that problem in 2004 arose, uh, in 2010, Forrester coined the term zero trust. And for those of you that aren't familiar with Forrester, they're an industry analyst. Uh, the, their prediction was essentially this need for deparameterization and the concept around zero trust. And we'll dive deep into uh, Forrester's model in a bit. It was very next-gen firewall focused, trying to create micro parameters. Uh, beyond Forrester, Google came out, came out with their own internal architecture around zero trust, and they called it Beyond Corp. It's still around today. It took, it took them many years to kind of perfect and work through it, a lot of custom development to realize some of the initial vision of, of zero trust. And then in about 2017, Forrester changed their existing zero trust model into what we call today zero trust extended. Now, today, zero trust is generalized across the industry as zero trust architecture. And, you know, every manager, CISO, and even in some cases, practitioners have this general interest in adopting zero trust. The one thing I do really want to get across uh, with this message is that while zero trust is this buzzword, it's not a new concept. And one of the first things I kind of proposed to different organizations is you, you really have to think about a concept that started in 2004 that today is really popular. Well, why haven't organizations already adopted it? And that's really kind of the goal is to understand, you know, if everyone agrees that zero trust is a good thing and everyone's been saying the same thing for 16 years, which is a pretty hard concept in cybersecurity, why today are organizations having challenges to it? And, you know, to define it at a very, very basic level, you know, the basic tenet of zero trust is ubiquitous least privilege access. So grant access, but make it specific. And so when you break that down, ubiquitous means everywhere. And this is one of the, the toughest parts. It's pretty easy to say, oh, I have an Active Directory infrastructure, I've got file sharing, and I'm only gonna allow certain groups to access certain files or directories. At the end of the day, when you start applying that least privilege across every single asset and resource, it becomes very, very difficult, very, very quick. And one of the, the things that uh, I will say that happens time and time again, it's uh, do or do not, there is no try. You're either you know working towards and doing zero trust and different aspects of operations and security engineering, or you're not. You're, you're not actually 
uh, setting that goal and working towards it. So, you know, a big funny takeaway is don't don't try. It, it It is possible. It's just a matter of, you know, setting that goal and working towards it. To go, you know, back into kind of some of the traditional approach versus zero trust, it's really about this concept of, of moving from IP addresses and network locations themselves as the point of policy and reference to being able to establish trust for every access request uh, for every resource across an organization. And it's applications, it's networks, making sure that only trusted users on a trusted device has the appropriate least privilege access to applications, data, workloads, et cetera. Now, one of, the, one of the fun parts about this is, is you know, there are some very specific literal definitions of zero trust. And you know, sometimes people get caught up in some of the literal definitions, just like when uh, someone went out and asked the baker to make this cake and say, hey, I, I'd like it to say, thanks for a great year in purple. And when you get down to literal terms, you know, sometimes they get misinterpreted. And that's really what I want you guys to take away today is, you know, there are some very hard set black and white goals associated with zero trust. And some of them are very uh, easy to implement and some of them are not. One of the, the first goals is to really make the assumption the network is always assumed to be hostile. And this is a, a pretty strong assumption, right? Treat every network like it's spying on you, like it's malicious, like someone's done ARP injection, IP spoofing, et cetera. Treat it like it's bad already. External and internal threats exist at all times. So you're gonna treat uh, every type of scenario with the most caution and concern, making sure that you, you focus on that. And then, <laughs> Every user device application and network flow is needs to be authenticated and authorized. I shouldn't have traffic or access of resources without knowing and authenticating and authorizing that behavior. Once I get past that, you have to start to look at automated and integrated systems that are going to allow the zero trust architecture to work in that real world operations. And finally, the, the policies need to be dynamic and calculated from as many sources of context as possible. Uh, the other two on here are, are pretty self-explanatory. So even though you start doing all these things, all activity must be logged and accounted for. And just because I trust you right this second, it, it's earned and it's only temporary. So just because I trust you right this second doesn't mean your trust doesn't change over time. And this is kind of you know, graphically represented uh, pretty simplistically, right? I got to look at the device, the user, the data, the network, and, and the application and start to make policies based on the visibility and trust verification that can occur. So it, what type of device is it coming from? Who's the user? What's the data being accessed? And is it malware? And then is that data being encrypted at rest and at transit? And if all of this criteria is met, then I'm gonna provide least privilege or restricted access. And most of these concepts were very much so defined by the industry analysts. So it started out with those analysts making uh, these I'll call it architectures and, and predictions and requirements uh, on the Forrester side, Zero Trust Extended, that incorporated workloads, people, networks, devices, and data, all wrapped in automation and orchestration, along with visibility and analytics. On the Gartner front, uh, they have a similar model. They don't call it Zero Trust. They call it uh, Continuous Adaptive Risk and Trust Assessment. Now, one of the cool parts about the Gartner model is that it takes it kind of a step further. It's incorporating some of the risk management framework into how we apply zero trust principles to data networks and application access. Peeling this back a little bit, uh, just as I, as I talk, talk to you a little bit about the history, you kind of saw Forrester's made some changes. And you know, Forrester started with three initial pillars of zero trust. And one of their, their main things was extending that to include that automation and orchestration as well as visibility and analytics across 
the entire solution portfolio um, and, and architecture portfolio. Now, one of the, the reasons why that happened, I'll, I'll talk about in, in grave detail later, it's really about trying to make this plausible and, and easier to deploy. Because without automation and orchestration, you're going to sit there and write ACL after ACL after ACL to try to implement or achieve zero trust. So starting with some of the initial pillars, the other things that Forrester added on to this architecture was the concepts of people. And one of the things that is not new news is, you know, people themselves access resources through passwords and things that are very, very easily hacked. So establishing trust of people themselves and, and guaranteeing some form of identity and trust there was a very important tenant to add. Uh, workloads and applications, it's really about uh, the agile and changes that we're seeing to applications and workloads and making sure that there is no inherent trust from one part of an application to another. And we've seen time and time again with different exploits and different vulnerabilities and different uh, application attacks that have occurred that there's a lot of inherent trust in existing and legacy applications. Uh, this move to public and hybrid cloud has allowed organizations to reassess how trust works within their applications. And finally, data, you know, way too minute, too much data uh, doesn't is exposed both to the public in ways that shouldn't be exposed um, for general access. So things like classification and data classification, marking, and the ability to establish policies around both encryption at rest and then transit around the data. Now, after Forrester kind of termed that, that term zero trust, Gartner came out with this CARTA model for short. And really one of the things that I do like about it is it, it brings in a, a lot of risk associated with the model. So while the, the still core goal is least privileged access, uh, it really brings to light the need for cybersecurity hygiene. So, you know, vulnerabilities, software installation and entitlement and privilege as well as security posture itself. So being able to establish the posture of users and devices, applications, workloads, and data, then be able to measure and use digital risk and trust in a varied score and rate method was, was kind of critical to being able to extend all of the policy models out to organizations. Now you will see just in general, I will say most organizations are following the Forrester model a little bit closer than the Gartner model for different reasons. Um, and one of the kind of steps that happened in industry was just being able to take zero trust and, and get there as quickly as possible. The other one I mentioned in the history is the concept of Google's Beyond Corp. And Google's Beyond Corp uh, was a pretty prescriptive and methodical way to achieve zero trust. And they kind of set out the standard to say, hey, let's start by securely identifying the device, securely identifying the user, removing trust from the network itself, and externalizing apps and workflows so that whether you sit on premise or outside the network, we were able to enforce policy uh, anywhere. And finally, implementing inventory-based access controls. Another way to just say incorporate risk, trust, and compliance into the access control policy. Now, what's cool about you know, this model when you look at it on paper, Gar or, or Google did, did this many, many years ago. And at the same time, you know, this model still applies and is still utilized by Google internally and is also utilized by other manufacturers uh, out there that are provisioning or, or supplying different zero trust uh, application access architectures. So G Google's Beyond Corp, when you, when you peel back kind of the marketing buzz behind it, uh, exists with you know, basic fundamental technologies like Radius so that we can authenticate you know, users into wired wireless uh, and virtual private network or VPN uh, devices 
an access proxy and some form of single sign-on incorporated with uh, things like multi-factor authentication. Now, all of this is kind of combined into a access control engine, which can allow for that device inventory database and trust inference to occur. Now, we've, we've seen how those analysts and, and some of the basic research started to move the market you know, many years ago. The biggest problem was as customers kind of and organizations around the world started looking at this thing and they said, hey, this is kind of cool. We'd like to get to zero trust architecture. And the first thing that the vendors out there did was uh, the marketers started to learn that term. And about, I'll, I'll call it two and a half, three years ago, if, you, if any of you went to you know RSA in San Francisco, immediately every security booth had this marketing that was focused on zero trust and it didn't matter what the security product was it was magically a solution to zero trust and you know in reality there is some truth to you know every security tool out there having a capability in zero trust why because if there's role-based access control or any type of policy inside of that tool then it's going to help with zero trust now this has kind of bubbled up quite a bit and in the in the U.S., one of the really important parts uh, that people like myself and, and others within industry were, were trying to uh, make clear was we, we've got to stop with the subjective view of what zero trust is. And so finally, we were able to get uh, NIST to really release a, a zero trust standard. And so today, it's a very good thing to be able to state that in August of 2020, NIST, after I think two or three drafts, uh, was able to release the formal version of NIST 800-207, which is zero trust architecture. Now, the goal with this, this uh, NIST standard was really to be able to help organizations kind of uh, look at zero trust from a, an open standard or a, a standard implementation approach. And one of the cool parts about it is, is it breaks it down into uh, some very high level architecture down to some core capabilities. So while those industry analysts still have very much weight in you know, how we evaluate or look at zero trust, NIST helped us kind of visualize and look at uh, as organizations, vendors, and the security community, you know, what are core concepts that are non-negotiable in zero trust? And that's everything from uh, the policy enforcement point itself to the policy engine, how the policy administrator will work within the system to the external data inputs in external systems that should drive zero trust architecture. And this is probably one of the most important points, which is, you know, how do I, as an organization, look at zero trust architecturally, knowing that no matter how hard I try, I'm going to have to go from a semi-open network to least privilege ubiquitously across an organization. And one of the other kind of helpful parts is some of the trust algorithms. So, you know, while many organizations might have their own uh, variables associated with do I trust this user? Do I trust this device? You can see generally within this model, uh, building a very basic trust algorithm based on access request and subject database and, and history, your asset database and threat intelligence, all driving that access request. And this is, this is really cool, right? Because you start to incorporate risk and trust is a part of every access request that happens across an organization. These are things like, hey, if I've seen a malware incident from an, an endpoint, I don't want to allow access to Office 365 anymore. Now, the other thing inside the draft, and I'll move away from, from NIST, uh, is just this concept of deployment cycle. And NIST did a good job kind of explaining in the risk management framework steps how zero trust can be accomplished over time. So I do encourage the audience to kind of go download and start to 
uh, look at 800-207. I think it's it's very well written. Uh, both Cisco and other vendors were a part of it. The industry analysts added feedback. A lot of large organizations out there added feedback from many different industry types. So you'll see a lot of great uh, reference material if you're starting to go down this journey. With, with that, I do want to spend quite a bit of time and the second kind of half of this session focused on some of the technical realities of implementing a zero trust architecture. And, and for me, this is kind of where the rubber meets the road. Like uh, one of the things that we're constantly hearing is, and you'll see not just this article that was put out on dark reading, but many organizations publicly stating that, there, I would say for most organizations out there, uh, leadership, including CISO and CIO, and, and even in some cases, the executive boards of organizations are agreeing that zero trust is the right direction. And they would like to adopt it by the end of 2020. Now we're almost there already. Uh, but realistically, most of the professionals lack the knowledge to implement the right technologies is the end result. And some of the, the challenges uh, with lack the knowledge is all because of the lack of uh, standards and the lack of an understanding of what that strategy and implementation should look like. Uh, the other thing that occurs is kind of what I like to call my top five, the top five major implementation challenges that people run into when they actually get into the meat of implementing zero trust. And, you know, for kind of my number one, it's doing what's right, not what's easy. And, and to, to say it simply, you can look at many different basics of cybersecurity out there. And, you know, everyone kind of knows these things. This, this is one of my favorites because it's simple, right? It's 20 controls from the CIS that represent very, very basic steps that organizations should take that will help with cybersecurity as a whole. Now, if you look at the basic six, the basic six include concepts like inventory and control of hardware assets and software assets. Now, while that is a very simplistic task, how, it, you know, I'll probably meet with 100 to 200 different organizations in a year. And those 100 to 200 out of that, I would say nine, over 90%, if I ask them right this second to list and give me a good count of all hardware and software assets that exist, both for user-based and userless devices, cloud assets, IoT assets, most of those organizations couldn't give that number. Now, many organizations have dis disparate tools to collect that data, but a central single view into that data is very, very rare. Um, a good example in, in the US is if you look at the public sector side, uh, the United States government looked at a program called Continuous Diagnostics and, and Mitigation and Monitoring, also known as CDM. And the whole program was about trying to change from point in time uh, assessments and vulnerability and risk assessments to a continuous monitoring approach. And the goal was to have this view. It's been billions of dollars and many years later and many organizations are starting to get those results, but it was not easy and it was a very long road to be able to check that box and say, yes, we do have a good view that's real time of my hardware, software, and then on top of that add things like vulnerability management. So once I have the, the hardware and software, now I can start to get better views into things like vulnerabilities, uh, both on uh, workloads, ephemeral, so cloud-based containers, serverless, those kind of things, as well as the traditional uh, IoT devices. And one of the things that makes you know, this so difficult is how agile most organizations have become. It used to be 10 years ago that if you wanted to add an IoT device to an organization to you know, increase a operational procedure within their business, 
you would go down to IT, IT would evaluate that offering and procure it. Now we have lines of business that are gonna go to Amazon and buy a new widget to help and, or go to a direct vendor and procure something that is going to help them achieve their mission or uh, efficiency within their business. IT has to be able to kind of respond in the same agile nature and be able to do things like, oh, I saw this brand new device come up and it's IoT. Let me do an immediate scan to know whether it's vulnerable because half of those embedded operating systems are coming out of the gate with some level of vulnerability and you have to be able to assess risk and vulnerability prior to giving device access. And that's where re really some of the concepts of zero trust Kind of occur is uh, you know before i might do things manually now i have to have that real-time picture nothing can connect nothing can actually create communication unless i establish trust which incorporates all of these basic cybersecurity hygiene uh, concepts the other example i'll give you of doing what's right and uh not or, or doing what's hard and, and right, not what's easy, is you know network segmentation. And obviously I work for Cisco, so this is a concept that I talk to a lot of organizations about. What really irks me is you know we're in 2020, we still see so many examples of ransomware and lateral movement that you know as an organ as an industry, it's difficult to kind of come back with, well, why? Why is this occurring? Like when you see ransomware go across, you know, 4,000 servers, 45,000 PCs and 25,000 apps in less than 10 minutes for an organization, the real answer is, you know, this should not occur. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. The, one of my first jobs I ever had uh, was a network analyst at a um, healthcare organization. And, you know, I'm very, very young. This first job I'm talking, I was 17 years old. <laughs> and one of my first uh, second shift uh, weeks at this job, a little thing started happening. And uh, long story short, a lot of millions of dollars lost and it was SQL Slammer. And SQL Slammer came in, it infected a development server and started to spread from server to server to server to server. Now, the funniest part about this story is not that SQL Slammer hit an organization that I was working at, was the, the next Monday when everyone was in an all hands, uh, the CIO, CISO was asking, well, what could we have done to prevent this? And me being a naive young person raised my hand in front of a lot of people and said, well, if you would have had the appropriate VLANs and segmentation between development and production, it wouldn't have occurred. Now, while I was correct, I learned the really hard lesson that, you know, what's what's right is, is sometimes not very easy, meaning uh, they hadn't gotten to that project yet because of other production concerns. Now, the other thing that no one wants to see is to get to a, a place where they see this, uh, you know, ransomware screen, but it happens every day. So what are some of the general recommendations? It's configure access controls with least privilege in mind. Now, when you think about ransomware and this concept of physical and logical separation of networks and data, one of this screams zero trust. And one of the concepts I, I want you to walk away with is, it doesn't require spending millions of dollars for an organization to actually achieve physical and logical separation of some of these networks. In the concept of ransomware, I would say most of the samples that are out there use MS RPC or MS SMB to communicate. Now, for most organizations, they don't need two Windows machines communicating on SMB or RPC. So a simple access list that restricted every device from communicating on those ports would solve the issue. Now you've been able to do that on switches and routers and access points for 15, 20 years. Now, most people haven't taken the time to implement those basic controls to prevent this type of lateral movement. And 
you know, this is the opportunity. This is one of the implementation uh, goals of zero trust is there's there shouldn't be trust between two endpoints that are out there on a network just because they're sitting in a building. The same way that there shouldn't be trust between two remote employees that are connected to the same either zero trust VPN or remote access VPN or, or something like that. I don't see any questions yet. If you do have questions, please put them in the chat window and I, I will definitely respond to them live as we go. Otherwise, I start to feel like I'm just communicating to myself. <laughs> now, you know, kind of the second thing that comes about, and I deal with this quite a bit, is the concept of distributed data sources. And I'll take it a step further, which is distributed data sources, when we get down to the granular details of implementing Zero Trust, gets back to being able to bring enough data into the algorithm to make good trust-based decisions. So a good example is going back to that NIST algorithm, uh, trust algorithm that I sh I, I'm showing you on the screen. If I'm an organization and I have an existing security architecture, most likely to answer all of these questions, to input information about threat intelligence, logging, resource policies, asset database, subject and history, all of this information is potentially more than one product or solution just in each category. So even if, if it was two, you're looking at 10 different solutions that are needed to provide information to generate a trust decision for access. And this is where things get challenging with implementation. How do I take all of the disparate systems that are most likely best of breed, I've built them into my organization for a reason, and bring them together so I can have a ubiquitous least privilege policy. And this is the kind of number one integration challenge that organizations face is while three quarters of organizations surveyed want to implement zero trust, it's a lot of work to get all of that data so that you can make good decisions. The other thing that occurs is, you know, just trying to figure out the trusted endpoint. Like, how do I establish trust for the different devices that are connecting to different resources? And in a lot of cases, there's not one equation, it's multiple equations. Now, my favorite analogy is, you know, growing up as a kid in the States, we would have fairs or carnivals, or even if you go to Disney World or, or some other place, they'd all have the, you must be this tall to ride this ride. And Zero Trust and Trusted Endpoint kind of bring some of those same concepts. So if I have a user accessing a corporate intranet site, SharePoint or something like that, it's pretty public data, or, or in my organization, it's pretty public data. So the minimum requirement to get to that resource is going to be a lot less than personal identifiable data or healthcare data or payment data. So being able to start to establish different levels of uh, different levels of trust based on the risk and the value of a asset is super important here. The other thing that gets very, very challenging is, well, how much do I start to incorporate some of these disparate systems to establish this. You know, my IoT management system is different than my Windows endpoint management system, which is different than my firewall management system. So bringing that data together is really kind of a prerequisite, starting to get a holistic view. The third thing is creating and maintaining policy. Like I said, one of the, the questions you have to ask yourself is, well, everyone agrees least privilege is good. Why don't people really do it? And when I say creating policy, I really mean creating policy. Uh, one of the hardest things to do is least privilege access to the internet. Why? The other thing I, I haven't explicitly stated today is least privilege can also be looked at as a whitelist model. And the same reasons why organizations have challenges with whitelist models or uh, approved list models across industry is it's difficult. 
And like one of my favorite examples of working with a customer uh, who was implementing zero trust is we had gotten them to some very good lease privilege. They were in the medical arena. They were, uh, they had a lot of different device types. So the, the way they were able to do that for one medical device, it was a MRI machine. And so they had baselined and profiled all the traffic from this MRI machine, and they had created a lease privilege policy for internal and external communication to the, the internet. Now, they call me up and they're like, uh, well, you know, your tool is showing me this. And it was that M same MRI machine that we had baselined and, and worked through uh, a bunch of denies to Apple. Now, the, the real question was, why is an MRI machine trying to communicate with Apple? And this happens surprisingly way too often. The night before or during the night, the manufacturer was pushed an update to that MRI machine. That update to the MRI machine actually enabled streaming audio from Apple Music. Now, as an information security person, how are you supposed to predict those changes to your environment? The goal was, and what actually worked in this incident was they were able to immediately get alerted and get the appropriate knowledge of the change. And if you, you're not familiar with MRI machines, they're super loud. And most of them now have headphone jacks. So you go in and you can put on your own headphones. And in this case, that MRI was streaming some Apple music to it. So pretty interesting. But think about that's one device of potentially 5,000, 10,000, 50,000 different device types within an organization. How do I actually get to least privilege for all of them? I can't manually do this process. And even if I could manually get to a policy, I need to be able to automate that policy over time. Otherwise, I'm going to have to add, you know, tens or hundreds or even thousands of people to be able to manage that need for least privilege policy. The other thing that's difficult is, um, you know, the API connections between devices and applications. So when we think about like least privilege, you can even get down to the level of, well, I'm allowing this device to communicate to this device on port for TCP port 443. Well, everything is TCP port 443 today. So how do I make sure that I look at a further uh, connection and context of the communication? So being able to ensure that I actually trust the communication and I can look at the content itself to make sure it's not malicious, it's approved, et cetera. The other thing that's, you know, some people say uh, it's more difficult. In my mind, it's actually a good transition or helpful part, which is moving from traditional service-oriented applications to microservices. One of the, the best things that's happening with microservices is I'm building into my continuous integration and deployment pipeline what ports, what communication, what services. So being able to get to least privilege between those applications is much easier than it used to be. Now, to solve this problem, it's going to be a process. So most organizations focus on you know, utilizing tools to be able to discover, baseline, create the policy, enforce the policy, and then also loop this back together. So monitor for, for changes and then be able to influence either automatically or through a human approval, the changes to the policy as they happen. One other concept I do want to bring up is with you know, being able to deploy and manage policy is the concept of being able to have scalable or, or agile policy. So when I create a policy for a trusted employee on a trusted device that has access to this workload or application, I don't want to have to write that again every time a new employee comes on. And so one of the most kind of critical steps here is to make sure that the policy itself is going to be dynamic and incorporate dynamic context both through uh, API usage and integration usage. So you're not making changes to make that occur. The other thing I do want to talk about is like the traditional approach, like why this is so hard. It used to be like the app guy would be able to gather some data, super excited about it, present the data, and typically the security person had to take 
some form of limited documentation, most likely in Microsoft Excel, and try to generate a policy. And what we found is most organizations are trying to do it the manual way. It can take months or years, and by the time you finish, it, it, it doesn't work. So, you know, getting to this automated discovery and validation of, of, of a proposed policy is critical. And then to actually operationalize it, I think the most important part is to be able to monitor, audit, and scale that policy over time. Now, as security researchers, it's always much easier to look at this as, well, it's, it's not difficult. Like I can, I can do all of these things. What I challenge you and the audience to do today is try to do this at your house. Like you've got 10 devices, you might have a, you know, a smartwatch, a smart door lock, or if you're like me, you're, you know, persistently uh, pessimistic and don't want to bring smart devices into the house, house as much. But, you know, look at those traffic patterns, try to create least privilege and see how you turn out because it's actually so much harder to actually implement than people uh, give organizations credit to. The, the fourth thing in my list is this concept of ubiquitous. So policy enforcement everywhere. And this became a lot harder. Um, one of the benefits of remote workforce and what the pandemic did worldwide though is immediately push organizations to focus on how they can ubiquitously push policy and enforcement to any, any device, any user, anywhere. And that includes, you know, applications, files, cloud, SaaS services, et cetera. Now, before I really turn you off to zero trust, there are some good starting points. And one of the things along with super big technology enhancements are being able to start small and grow over time. And I typically recommend looking at, you know, good wins here, right? Uh, some of the use cases that are most popular are to prioritize based on risk. If I have the crown jewels, if I'm a hospital, it, it's potentially patient data. If I'm a bank, it's financial data. Focusing on intellectual property protection, export controls, doing basic hygiene like prod dev segregation are all quick wins. The other thing that's really big is being able to identify some simplistic things like, hey, if it's not a managed device, I'm going to treat it differently because I don't have the administrative control over that device to ensure it's not hacked or owned. So there are some really cool quick wins there. And the final one that I want to bring up, because what you'll find is so many people kind of stop there, like they create the policy, they've got some least privilege, they're doing establishment of trust, meaning they're authenticating users and devices, they're uh, making sure that the connection is secure with encryption, but once they do that, it kind of stops. And so this last kind of implementation challenge is focusing on the concept of continuously verifying trust. And with with that, what I mean is just because you walk into my house as my guest, I, I immediately start to trust you because I'm letting you in because you look okay and I, I've met you in the past. Now, if you start to you know, do something inconsistent, you have an indication that you're going crazy, I'm going to change the level of trust. And the same thing occurs in security. So it doesn't stop after checking the posture and the status of the device one time. You have to continually be able to incorporate threats, risk, and changes within the environment to dynamically change trust levels. And this is a lot harder to implement than it is to say. You know, I'll give you the best example. This is this is easy, for example, if I have control over the network or the device or the endpoint or the application. But let's let's give the example of SaaS or SAML. Um, you know, SAML integration for zero trust might occur because I'm inserting myself into the authentication process. As a part of that authentication process, I'm going to check whether I, you know, trust the user, I trust the device, and it hasn't been uh, malicious up to that point. Now. If that SaaS provider provides me the appropriate APIs, if I see a threat or an indication of compromise or anomaly, I might be able to do a very custom change to that level of trust to log the user out. 
in most cases, once SAML finishes and the assertion is done, I have no control over that session anymore. So even though my endpoint security system tells me that, hey, this system has downloaded ransomware or has uh, indicated different behaviors that are bad, I have nothing I can do to stop the access other than a manual intervention. Uh, and even if I do have an automatic API I can call to change the trust, that's going to be per SaaS product. You know, it might be completely different if I'm going to an HR system versus a finance system, and I've got to implement or code that connection between one product or another, or incorporate tools like security orchestration and automation to be able to make that change occur. So a few closing thoughts. I, I hopefully, you know, one helped you understand that it is a valuable effort to, you know, incorporate least privilege. I don't think anyone in the security community could go against that rec general recommendation. I also hope you kind of started to see some of the challenges with ubiquitous least privilege access and how you can't just do what you've been doing for 10 years as far as implementing policy, operationalizing policy to get there. You got to change things. And so it, it, it is a journey. And I get asked quite a bit like, well, all right, you just overwhelm me a lot. Where do I start and how do I get there? And so, you know, this is a representation. It kind of starts with a strategy. Uh, and in my mind, the, the number two thing that should be a, a appropriate as a part of that strategy is to identify sensitive and mission critical workflows. This could be based on the organization or the risk. And from there, we can start to do things like generate the visibility for establishing trust of users and devices. Like there are basic hygiene things that can help you do that. Like establishing trust of user can be as simple as using, you know, multi-factor authentication so you know it's not a hacked password. Uh, establishing device trust could be leveraging your mobile device management or endpoint management to make sure it's managed prior to device access. Once you get there, you can start to implement trust-based policies and micro-segmentation, micro-perimeters, pick your marketing term for that. It's really least privilege uh, access. And this is done, you know, step by step. It's not going to be done ubiquitously with one push of a button, it's going to be done over time. And as a part of this, you have to embrace the automation, orchestration, and analytics that allows you to operationalize the full stack. Uh, finally, uh, I will add with this, I kind of add my own perception, which is this is a generally accepted methodology for Zero Trust Journey. I would actually encourage and really push for automation, orchestration, analytics, prior to actually trying to implement a lot of these things. You're not going to be able to keep up with that least privileged policy without the automation to help provision and push policy long term. With that said, I, I know I went a little bit over. I, I apologize. I'm, I'm still around for questions. I also put my contact info up on the uh, uh, starter slide. So if anyone has questions, please free, feel free to reach out. Thank you, Jimmy. It was very interesting. Uh, there is two questions. Um, the first one uh, is someone is asking if there's any good implementation or good implementation in progress of Zero Trust in the wild. Yeah, there, there absolutely is. There's uh, quite a few and uh, some of them are more public than others. Uh, at Cisco, we have a lot of customers in that journey. The successful implementation, it, defend, it depends on what you define as successful. Uh, and you know, a lot of organizations having that full least privileged policy everywhere, they're still on that journey to get there. So I, I won't say that people have hit, or a lot of organizations have hit that destination. With that said, many have taken the baseline steps to get there. Okay, another question. Uh, someone is asking, Automated discovery may cause disruption or degradation of PRD environment. Do we have any tip or to, or to comment on that? Uh, PRD environment. Sorry, I was missing the, the question there. Um, P, 
PRD. Uh, there is, can a person specific, okay, in production. Oh, in production, can they, can they do what? Okay, automated discovery because disruption or degradation of production environment. Do you yes. have any now, now I get the question. So the, the question is trusting the, trusting the automated policy, which is a very valid question. Uh, one of the things to reduce risk there is trying to figure out what the appropriate time for baselining is. Uh, and it, it, the, the short answer is it, it's different per organization and even down to the level of applications. Like I have organizations that I work with that they run disaster recovery events once a year. Well, if you do your policy baseline uh, in March and you have run that DR event in December and you start enforcing a policy that you baselined in August, it's not gonna have that traffic to baseline. So uh, there are a lot of steps that you can do to minimize the risk and disruption. A, a lot of it's all based on time though. So depending on how mission critical, what the effects and risk of do, implementing that policy are, uh, depends on how quickly you can deploy and, and really minimize the risk of deploying it. Thank you. Uh, okay. What is your recommendation around the fact that we control less and less device? Example, IoT and sometimes macro segmentation make it harder to discover new devices or services on the networks or in virtual environment and the impact on implementing zero trust? Yeah, that's a great question, and it comes up quite a bit. Um, I actually, I'll start with microservices because it makes it a little bit easier. Microservices, depending on the deployment, uh, depends on how easy it, e easy it is. For the sophisticated organizations that are setting up what we call CICD pip pipelines or continuous integration and deployment pipelines, uh, we can, we do, there's a whole movement around what we call shift left, which means instead of waiting until that application gets deployed, I'm going to do establishment of trust and policy in the development phase. So as a developer creates code, it is checked in, it is scanned, it is able to um, create the least privileged policy as it gets developed so that when it gets deployed, it's, it's fully in least privileged mode. With IoT, there are things that you can do. The challenge is, is the techniques that you would do for an IoT sensor that's connecting via LTE or 5G might be different than the IoT device that connects via wired or wireless Ethernet. Um, and, and one great example or one quick win is being able to not trust them until you establish trust. So how do you establish trust of an IoT device? In most cases, if you don't have access to source code or a login to that machine, you're left with the network point of view of you know, vulnerability scanning. And one technique that is important is you do have the capability, and I've done this for a lot of customers, being able to say, all right, this IoT device that just connected to the network doesn't get access until I run my vulnerability scan. And once it runs that vulnerability scan, if it has CVEs greater than 9.0, I'm not going to allow it access onto my network. If it if it is allowed access, once it's on, I'm going to continually monitor its behavior. If I see risky or threat behavior going to malicious sites, then I will no longer or I will kick it off. So it's really building the, the work streams and the automation so you can establish trust, enforce the least privileged policy, and then even at that point, start to monitor for anomalies and malicious behavior. Thank you. Uh, that's the end. There is no other question. Awesome. So, thank you. Have a nice day. And that's over for the track B for today. So the track B will continue tomorrow. Have a, have a good night. And for the people who are, do, we will do the CTF. Good luck. Bye-bye.